Okay. Hey, everybody, and welcome. This is the uh, Apostate Prophet. Uh, I hope you're having a fantastic day. I'm here today with a uh, guest that I will appreciate very much, and so will many of you as well. We will talk about a lot of things that I uh, personally find very interesting, uh, especially about um, you know, Arabia, pre-Islamic Arabia, uh, several matters that we never deeply go into and that we don't have much information on. Dr. Hyland, how are you doing? Very nice to be here. Thank you to talk to you. It's a real pleasure to have you here. I read of your stuff, of your research uh, many times in the past. For some reason, I never thought about actually getting in touch. And then I thought I, out of the blue, it's, it's, at some point I thought, why don't I just contact him and ask mm -hmm. to speak to him? Uh, <laughs> I read I read uh, two of your books so far. I read uh, um, In God's Path, which, I, which is, I think, uh, very interesting. And uh, the whole... You early conquests of uh, the conquests of, of Islam. And then the other book I have right here, which I find personally very interesting, uh, Arabia and the Arabs, uh, that I think is very, very insightful. Um, and I would definitely recommend others get these books as well. So uh, I want to ask you right away, uh, when it comes to the whole issue of pre-Islamic um, Arabia, and all the knowledge that we have on pre-Islamic Arabia regarding the culture and the religious practices and all that, it seems to me that um, there is not much information available for the general population. There is not much that we can uh, find online if we do a quick search. The information about pre-Islamic Arabia seems rather, um, you know, uh, obscure, rather hidden. Uh, why is that the case? Yeah, I mean, you're definitely right. I mean, it's actually the main reason I wrote this book, because trying to teach pre-Islamic Arabia to the students was actually very difficult. A lot of the literature is very specialist, um, heavily focused on things like inscriptions and very detailed philological analysis. I think the main reason it's a difficult subject to access is the material is very diffuse. We're talking about a huge area, but there's large desert regions. It was difficult to traverse before modern means of transportation. And it, it, perhaps I should say, when I was going to write this book on Arabia, I'd expected to be able to write a, a more uniform sort of work, but I kept coming up against the problem that it falls into different zones. And that really goes back to the very basic differences in the environment and hydrology. So in Yemen, you get monsoon rains, East Arabia, there are aquifers, and in the Northwest of Arabia, you have oases. So it's a really, but that, and that, in a pre-modern world where people are so much attached to their, the basic facts of the environment, that means that it generates very different types of culture. And that makes it more difficult to study. It's not a single zone, which we tend to think of now as uh, just Arabia, and that's it. Yeah, there's, there's also an element that I saw uh, emphasized in your other book, which is about the conquest in God's Path, uh, where uh, you are trying to clarify this whole idea that um, you're basically trying to, you, you are explaining that people often think about uh, Arabia and pre-Islamic Arabia as you know a, a more uh, united uh, culture, whereas in reality, it was uh, very diverse, very different internally, both before Islam and even after the rise of Islam, during the early conquests, for example. Um, I, I remember uh, reading that and finding that very, very insightful. Uh, what could we say about the sources regarding um, pre-Islamic Arabia? Are these sources, uh, where are these sources mainly from? Are these Islamic sources mostly that we have at our disposal at the moment? So this is the other reason why it's quite difficult to study because they're very fragmented and diverse. You have the writings of outsiders, and those can be in many, many languages, particularly Greek, different dialects of Aramaic, Latin, um, but they're very much outsiders. And they don't know that much. A lot of it is hearsay. It, they become better informed once the um, trade routes become more established between the Mediterranean and India, which go right round Arabia and so people start to take more notice because they have to put in their ports and so on but nevertheless they're outsiders so it's a particular perspective in terms of insider writings it's mainly inscriptions which come 
particularly from Yemen, uh, and inscribed objects. But we a certain number, a fair number, really from Northwest Arabia and from the east, but but much less than and much um, less in scale than because in Yemen you get these fantastic monumental inscriptions on tombs and palaces, and, and those number in the thousands. So that, that's a rich source. For the history of Arabia, the other form. So some sources are time limited. So pre-Islamic Arabian poetry is very rich, but it is only from this very short period, probably about the fifth and sixth centuries AD. I see. And when it comes to the uh, the Islamic sources, um, you, one could assume that um, there is a certain bias in Islamic sources regarding uh, the pre-Islamic Arab history, right? Because uh, especially since in, in Islam, there is this whole idea that the uh, pre-Islamic era is called the era of ignorance, the Jahiliya. And um, I would say Islamic sources, or the Islamic sources which tell us about pre-Islamic Arabia uh, are have a certain bias, right? Yeah, that's part of the problem, that they're looking at it through the lens of Islam and seeing you know, bas uh, never basic sense that people before Islam are basically doomed to, <laughs> to hell, so that doesn't help <laughs> impartial yeah, yeah. historical writing. But the other thing really is that their only interest is in the Prophet's lifetime. Um, and a little before, but not very much. <laughs> so you're, yeah. And just the Hijaz. So uh, and th this was another reason for me writing my book on Arabia because we're talking about thousands of years of history in a huge area and different cultures and, and yet from the Islamic sources you just get this little Jahiliya tag which is basically this one little northwest Arabian sector basically from around the period 550 to 620 so it's very limited. Speaking of this, um, this Islamic narrative that I myself also learned uh, in a Muslim upbringing, I'm a former Muslim, um, I learned that, uh, you know, it was very common, very frequent in pre-Islamic Arabia to bury little girls, uh, you know, as, as soon as they are born. Female infanticide was very big. And uh, Islam came and basically ended this cruel practice. And this whole narrative... Now, I understand that there are some um, disagreements about how accurate this is and how widespread this, uh, this practice really was. Is there more that we can know about this from a historical perspective? So we have zero evidence outside the Quran for this. It's mentioned in the Quran, and anything that is mentioned in the Quran will be commented on ad infinitum. You know, there's hundreds of years of people commenting on these individual verses, and to some extent, it generates historical material. And, and the people want to give specific examples because some of the commentary on the Quran is can be very serious, philological, legal, but some of it's more storytelling ish. You know, what's lying behind this particular reference? And then, ah, well, there was a time when so and so happened. We have no way to verify this at all. And obviously, as you said, it, it taps into the basic narrative of our Islamic sources that Islam improved the lot of the people of Arabia so, and made them better morally. There's a very famous hadith where put into the mouths of different companions saying, oh, we used to be terrible people, we worshipped idols, we, we, you know, we, raped, we pillaged, we buried our little girls. But now we've got Islam, we're all very decent, upstanding people. And I don't want to mean that in any way to belittle it, but, but I just mean that's a literary kind of picture that's being drawn up there. And it's very difficult to, you know, it's, it's a bit like, you know, the, the British could say, oh, we brought order to Africa. Before that, there was no order. But you know, again, it's, it's, a, it's a, a very specific <laughs> type of narrative that we can't just simply buy into. When it comes to... Um... Women, for example, we have a similar thing. The Islamic idea is that women were treated differently, treated as much lesser beings in the past, and that the pre-Islamic Arabs used to take uh, dozens of wives. It never ma really made sense to me how that would be possible, that the average uh, man in pre-Islamic Arabia just has like 20 wives or you know, 15 wives or whatever it is. Is this also something that is primarily just attributed to Islamic narrative or... Is there more to that? So again, we're reliant on the Islamic tradition for this. 
but actually it is quite different from what the Quran and later more religious narratives. So what I should say is it's potentially better to possible that we should separate out religious narratives and tribal narratives. In the tribal narratives, actually, no, people don't have many wives, and you would expect that because they're not very wealthy. Um, what, but what is happening is that they may be having many affairs. So there's more adultery going on, if you like, and more secret liaisons. And that's also backed up by pre-Islamic Arabian poetry. Whereas in, under Islamic times, especially in the early Islamic times, the Arabs are much more wealthy, much more powerful, have much more access to women, particularly foreign women. And so you see more actual wives and concubines in a formalized way. But yeah, you know, zina, fornication, adultery is much more stringently um, prohibited. What can we say about um, the general practices? We know certain things about pre-Islamic Arabia that we mostly know from Islamic sources, also some from uh, quite some research that has been done. In general, could you say that there is a, a unifying identifier of certain uh, beliefs and practices that pre-Islamic Arabs uh, you know, had that held them together? Or is it just a huge variety of different beliefs? So somewhere in between those two, I would say. So as I say, you have very different cultures there. So in Yemen, East Arabia, and Northwest Arabia, you have di distinct cultural zones. And within those zones, you see a fair degree of uniformity of religious belief. Um, for more pastoralist areas in Central Arabia, going towards the very nomadic groups, then it's a very different situation. And there's a lot, you know, you're not precisely because they're nomadic, you're not going to see temples. We don't have inscriptions from them. So our only source really is actually pre Islamic Arabian poetry. And then you see very little reference to religion and gods and so on. So mm -hmm. it, it seems like different, both geographical zones and different um, cultural groups will have different religious practices. Now, there's a huge so all these pagan inscriptions, basically they've gone by around 400 AD. And at this point, we have extremely little evidence because we used to have all these wonderful inscriptions, but they just stop pretty much dead at that mm -hmm. time. And it's, we assume that as with the rest of the Middle East, people are switching more to Judaism and Christianity. So to be honest, we have no real information from that, which is why for the period after 400, especially the Hijaz, you have a lot of weird and wonderful theories by modern scholars about the fact that maybe that's not where Islam was born, maybe you know everyone was Christian. We just don't know, to be honest. Yeah, it's a yeah. huge amount of speculation from zero evidence. We also have an influx of, um, of Abrahamic religion at some point, right? I mean, as, as well, that's what they say, yeah, Christianity and Judaism must be they definitely must be spreading at this time because you can see in the northeast you're seeing some christian churches and monasteries mm -hmm. on on the very fringes which could be partly to do with servicing trading communities and then in yemen as well then we have inscriptions which do mention um jews and christians and their beliefs and I think with the with the official recognition of certain doctrines uh, by the Roman Empire, um, there there, uh, there is a spread of um, Christian heresies in this region, as far as I understand it, uh, as mentioned in certain early uh, Christian sources. Um, as far as I know, please correct me if I'm wrong. So uh, the tricky thing is how much this is a literary topos or a kind of prejudice. So there's a number of sayings by people outside Arabia, that Arabia is a land of heresies. Um, oh, yeah. Whether that's because heretics were fleeing into Arabia as a safe haven because you were, can get away from the <laughs> authorities, uh, or whether there's, it's just general prejudice against more pastoralists and, and so on, it's impossible to say, really. The other evidence which some people adduce who like this idea as Arabia as a land of heresies is the Quran itself, because it seems to have a number, or it refers to a number of doctrines of Christians, most famously the fact that Jesus wasn't really crucified, it was just an mm -hmm. image of him. And that is close to a doctrine of certain Christian groups from the 
third, fourth centuries. And there are also certain narratives about Jesus in general that seem to correspond with uh, uh, later heretical writings or legends mm. uh, as they are seen within Christianity about Jesus. And so, Yes. It's very difficult, though, to tie these individual references in the Quran to groups, although there's a very, um, there's a lot of scholarship <laughs> expended on it. It's kind of popular. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Partly because on the serious side, uh, there was an attempt, and it's a very interesting one, to link Quranic doctrines and references to contemporary late antique writings in the broader world of Palestine and Syria, and, uh, which is a very interesting study and has had some good results. What can we say about uh, coming back to Arabia, specifically to the Hejaz region? Now, um, with the emergence of Islam, uh, according to the standard traditional narrative uh, revolves around Mecca and Medina. And in Mecca, uh, Muhammad is born into, or Muhammad is in, in a society where people are described as polytheists. They have certain idols, certain temples. One of them is Mecca. Uh, now, the Islamic narrative is, of course, that, uh, that, that the Kaaba is, sorry, uh, Kaaba. The Islamic narrative is, of course, that the Kaaba is attributed to uh, worship in the one God and to Abraham and all that. Uh, what do we really know about the background and the history, specific, specifically the pre-Islamic history of uh, the Kaaba? So, unfortunately, very little is the short answer to that. From Mecca and Medina itself, we have pretty much zero evidence, as you would expect, but the, from the archaeological point of view, because archaeology has never been allowed there. You might have expected inscriptions, but we do not have any at all from there. If we widen our lens a bit, we do find inscriptions in the older oases to the north, Medan Saleh, you know, so ancient Dedan, Ula. Tema as well. So from these oases, we have quite a few inscriptions, some Jewish, some pagan. But again, they, as I said earlier, they stop at around 400. The very latest dated inscription from that era is 456 AD, but most of them are much earlier. Um, and so that means we, we don't really have any hard evidence for constructing what's going on in that area. The fact that you have Jewish inscriptions very early, for example, in Medea in Saleh, already in the first century AD, suggests that Abrahamic ideas do circulate. To what degree they were adopted by non-Jewish populations, it's impossible to say. One thing I should say, again, looking at broader context, we we can, from inscriptions, see that some of the references to pagan practices in the Quran, for example, Nusub, standing stones, where you actually sacrificed an animal, and blood was meant to flow on the stone, so that is mentioned in pre-Islamic inscriptions. Um, stones, un ungraven stones, were considered um, what you call a betil, so a bait Allah, the idea of a, that they were where the deity um, had their representation on earth you know, reflect for that local community and often those were by springs so again you could say that uh, Kaaba and Zamzam in Mecca fit into this but it is only looking at broad context we don't have direct reference to Mecca. And there are some there are some theories about um, how stones like the black stone at uh, at the corner of the Kaaba, or stones similar to that, were used in connection to certain uh, fertility rites and you know worship in terms of fertility and sexuality. Is, is is there anything to that? So that's kind of comes from, as I said, the kind of tribal tradition, if you like, um, best represented by the Kitab Lasnam sort of literature that you get um, from Hisham al Kelbi and others. It, again, it's very difficult to assess what they know <laughs> or how much. So the, there's a, a literature coming out of Christianity towards pagans. It's a polemical literature it's saying that pagans do this. You know, this is how pagans think. They worship idols which they think are real living beings, even though surely they cannot help them. They have fertility practices because they're debauched people, these pagans. And so it's very difficult for us 
now without any contemporary evidence from Arabia to distinguish this later polemic from I what see. might have been I real see. practice. I see. Speaking of Kitab al-Islam, the Book of Idols, um, what I find very interesting in that book is it mentions uh, certain different uh, Kaabas or Kaaba-like buildings. Uh, for example, what most prominently we have uh, a certain temple down in Yemen, as it uh, is described, called Adul Khalasa, for example. Um, so there is, it seems as though uh, establishing certain buildings as uh, cubes, uh, because Kaaba is for cube, uh, was common practice in pre-Islamic Arabia and was different by was was practiced by people all over Arabia, right? Yeah, and this is so. Here we have good comparative evidence from the Nabataean realm, where you have quite a few cubes which are either just left untouched or they have like very minimal anthropological features like a mouth and a nose inscribed onto them and then a reference to the deity someone calling upon the praying to the de deity or making offerings to them so yes that does look especially so in that area the sandstone is very easy to carve um so that makes so obviously the carb is very different because it's probably a meteorite but um but stone worship is definitely there's good evidence for it across Arabia. What is, what is the significance of? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure if you can say anything about this, but what is the significance of um, of buildings like the Kaaba, of it being a cube that people refer to as a house? Uh, if this was common practice in pre-Islamic Arabia, what exactly was the purpose of that? So I suppose that well, you say it's a general human thing that. The idea of a totally transcendent deity who's up there and never has no contact with us is uh, unappealing. People would like some form of either place they can go to or some sense that the deity um, has contact with us. I mean, you could say that explains the whole idea of Jesus and Christianity. Um, and so the idea of houses of God, tales which are quite widespread, in fact, across the Middle East in the pagan period, is that this is a place you can go to and you can feel have some sense that the deity is actually present um, listening to you when you make your offerings or prayers to it yeah and I, and I guess the circumambulation around this house is then very much symbolically a veneration reverence of the specific deity or deities that this house is supposed to represent yes i mean it's it's difficult to exactly get into some of these pagan pro practices the actual significance of it but many of the practices that are mentioned to do with the um the hajj in arabia and the veneration of the kaaba are very quite broad well-known ones for example throwing stones at a pillar it is interesting how widespread that is across a number of areas of the middle east what about the numbers associated with these things like um circumambulation seven times for example or you know similar similar issues similar patterns and numbers are these merely um certain practices that came from previous cultures and which we don't have a proper explanation for what does that really look like yeah i mean when numbers are significant they tend to be magical numbers seven obviously days of week and so on like that and so the, the difficulty we have often with pagan practices is you can just, we can assume they're ancient, but we can't really demonstrate that because we're often tapping in then to prehistoric cultures where we have no text. It used to be a very popular idea in the 19th century that there was a there were an ancient sort of religion of of mankind and of just certain bigger cultures so there were books with titles like the religion of the semites you know that idea that all people of the middle east had a kind of ancient form of religion that they go back to in the same way as like there's one language there's one ur semitic language and the idea is that you if you look across the cultures you'll see these similarities and so you do i mean you could looking really far back stones are always important to pretty much all 
human cultures. It doesn't matter whether you go to Britain, you know, Stonehenge or you know, wherever. Um, there's that fantastic discovery in Turkey recently of this ring of stones with engravings, which is actually dated to something like 18,000 before the present. So it's, it's amazing. But it, uh, the problem with this sort of thinking is it's not that it's not so much that it's not true as much as it's so generalizing, which is what we really want to know is the details. What did it, your example of the circumambulation when people did this what did they what were they thinking of you know what did it signify for them this practice i i hear so many different theories about that one of the most common ones is that uh it kind of it uh is supposed to imitate the uh orbiting of objects in the sky around a certain uh main object not sure if that really makes sense though uh <laughs> or that this is merely a a, uh, a sign of veneration it's 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 kind of it's interesting to theorize about that i guess we don't really have a conclusive answer on that then no it's not something we can easily tap into ourselves is it then you know we've been our minds have been brainwashed by <laughs> monotheist religious ideas and so it's quite difficult to get into this polytheist and it depends what approach you take so if you're a more social theory of religion then you take it that it, these practices bind it's not that important what they are but the fact that you do them together as a community means that it binds you as a community but if you're more a symbolist then the symbols of whether it's to do with the planets or whatever is very important according to your estimation um now when i when i discuss about the kaaba and uh Kaaba's other Kaaba-like buildings, like the one mentioned in Yemen, for example, uh, that that one is very significant to me. I think to the narrative because we have a clear report in the Hadith in which Muhammad commands one of his uh, followers to go and destroy that certain uh, building, and the guy then goes and destroys it and kills the people around it and comes back, and Muhammad praises him, according to the narrative. And uh, when this is discussed, uh, some apologists offer the explanation that that building was an imitation of the Kaaba, which is the original cube uh, that was established. But from a non-Islamic perspective, it is hard to say what was the original Kaaba, whether there is an original Kaaba, and how widely uh, you know practiced it was to build such such cubes. Uh, what can we really say about uh, whether the Kaaba was just um, one more building like many others in this region, or whether it has some originality? So, in terms of how it's viewed, I mean, given that in the Nabataean realm from centuries before Muhammad, you're seeing these cubic objects. And, and I say the nice thing about taking the Nabataean realm is that we have inscriptions on them and they're telling us what they are. So we have a lot more information that way. So I would assume it's not so much to do with there being an original, because it makes no sense with regard to stones. I mean, <laughs> they're pretty ancient objects. So for you to say this one stone is the original, is that you know, it must be propaganda really. But it's more, I think, competition between different holy sites I see. and different deities and different representation representatives of the deities and this is very well attested in the pagan world going right back so when the assyrians for example want to demonstrate their strength they send an army down and they grab cultic objects of a particular group and we have actually instances of this going right back to the earliest references to arab groups in the syrian desert where it says you know the, we have in, pictures in fact on the Pal Assyrian palaces and temples where they show that the army grabbing the cultic objects of Arabs who or dwellers in that area, they had their tents nearby, so we know them since there are these pastoralist groups in Arabia and they're taking off the cultic objects because obviously by that means you demonstrate your superiority over there, that your god is superior to their god. Do we assume that the that the cube building itself, the Kaaba, was established due to uh, the black rock, the meteor meteorite rock, or whatever its origin may be? Or do we think that this is merely something that people took from somewhere else and put on there? Or do these two things depend on each other? Yeah, it's an interesting question. That, again, until you have scientific analysis of the Kaaba, it's not going to be easy to answer. Why, why is it, why is it not allowed to do uh why do they not allow to 
go into you know archaeological research and all that in this in this area is it for religious reasons i think and saudi their status really comes from being the guardian of the most holy sites of islam so that i can understand they're not really going to want that narrative to be questioned um the, uh, or just the broader idea which is a quite likely one to some extent that there were many cultic sites initially in the earliest period of islam including uh, jerusalem but that's not going to be popular with the Saudi government inevitably they like to preserve the, the standard narrative <laughs> understandably so I guess <laughs> um, there's one interesting thing that you mention in your uh, in your in one of your books in both of them I actually I think uh, which I personally find interesting which is um, that Arabia was home not only to uh, one prophet but uh, that it was a common thing in Arabia that prophets would emerge and prophets would declare a message. Do we have a certain um, you know, record of people who were self-proclaimed proclaimed prophets just like Muhammad who emerged before him and after him in Arabia? Yeah, so I don't think I'd say that it's common in general in all time in Arabia, but very specific in the time of Muhammad and a bit before as well we have references but again in Muslim sources to um, a number of prophets at the time you could assume that's because this is a time of well so you either take it that this was a common thing in general or that it was a particularly traumatic time and so it brought forth more prophets you could say you know at the moment thinking about climate change getting more serious we're getting more prophetic like figures who are predicting terrible times and so on um, so there's a kind of social anthropological background here which is that for people that are not used to being able to act to act politically to set up political structures and so on then religion provides that means by which they can unite a body of people that might be rather disparate otherwise it forms a common ideology if you like you see this um, in particular during colonial period with lots of prophets appearing in places conquered by the French and the British. And again, it, it's a way for that person because the, the, they had no proper political structures. The prophet serves to unite various peoples as one group. That's interesting. We, we have certain, um, there's especially one uh, self-proclaimed prophet in the time of Muhammad and also after his time, Musaylima. I think we have, uh, I remember reading in a certain Persian source that is from centuries later. And in that source, it is said that uh, people who believed in him as a prophet still continued to uh, you know, be around even in secret and that there, there are traces of his religion still uh, alive. Do you have any knowledge on this? Do you, did you ever look into this? Or? Yeah, and the difficult thing is it depends how skeptical you are towards the Muslim sources. Because we only have these accounts in Muslim sources That's from, the problem, you know, written start the very, very earliest Muslim source that you can actually you know, pick up and hold is from the 820s. So that's 200 years after Muhammad is active. So it's very difficult to know whether the accounts to, you know, increase the drama of the story of Muhammad, that he had to overcome opposition, or how much it ref reflects real events. And even if it reflects real events, how much they really, people writing 200 years later, had genuine information. Yeah, I guess it can't be taken at face value as, uh, you know, historically um, reliable or, or, or accurate. Uh, so some of the things said in there really surprised me, though. It's like, mm. um, I'm not sure if I'm. <laughs> I'm not sure if I'm supposed to present these things as, uh, you know, uh, good, positive, or as rather negative when you look at it from an Islamic perspective. But uh, such as that uh, he preached that we you should not make any speculations about supernatural beings, that there is no qibla, that there are only three daily prayers, that. Um, you can drink alcohol, you can have extramarital sex, and so on, like the, all these very big problems that Islam uh, presents, these very big, tight, moral laws that Islam presents are 
not found in this religion and this this religion apparently uh advocates for the contrary and all that but it, but anyway it's completely besides the point here <laughs> yeah well the interesting thing there i suppose is how are you meant to read this I mean, were the people who were being told this or reading it expressing horror you know this horror yeah, that, that, that's of, what know, i mean i mean in a modern sense you might think oh that sounds much better <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that, that's what Maybe i mean, I mean when, I, when i read this <laughs> When I read this, I'm like, oh, this is this is a this is much more free and liberal. But then, yeah. was was it really meant to be written that way, or was it just more, yeah. more a condemnation of it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, one issue is Allah. Now, um, Allah is the primary God of Islam, known as the One God. The issue is that the history and the origin of the name Allah and of the God Allah is a a matter that is quite problematic and that there is quite some controversy about. Some people assert that um, Allah existed as a separated deity within the uh, pre-Islamic uh, pagan culture. Others say, I think there is a theory that Allah is actually Hubal, who was the main uh, god of the Kaaba. Uh, there are other theories that Allah is merely just the monotheistic prophet adopted into Islam and so on. What do we know and what are your uh, findings on this? Yeah, this is a kind of fascinating question. To my mind, it's hard to think that the actual name isn't, um, concept isn't coming from the broader judeo-christian world because it's the same word allah is you know, the word in syriac aramaic generally for god understood as one big dominant um transcendent god the question i suppose is how then what is that getting applied to though in have they have they simply taken the judeo-christian god you know was muhammad or his predecessors or have they mapped it onto an existing pagan god? And to my mind, I have to say it's more, it seems more likely to me that it's a Judeo-Christian thinking, because as Judaism and Christianity spread through the peninsula, then you would expect ideas of God in that sort of sphere, that it's a creator god that is you know, transcendent and all-powerful, and that's and it's actually the pagan gods will be being pushed away, not simply being not being adopted. Because the mapping tends to happen from pagan to pagan cultures. So for example, the pagan Arabian goddess Allah gets mapped onto Athena. And so that you expect that substitution. But I don't think we have examples where you know Zeus is mapped onto the god you know, Hotheos, you know, so I, I, I don't think that mapping is really occurring. The, to my, the arguments for it being an Arabian god, Arabian pagan god, tend to be made by those who want to say that it's an Arabian heritage, that Allah belongs to Arabia, it's nothing to do with, it's not simply being adopted from the Roman world. As far as I um, see it, as a non-expert layman on these matters, uh, I, th I think it is quite um, reasonable to suggest that it is the same understanding of the supreme god that is ad adopted from, uh, you know, monotheistic uh, or, or, I don't know, Abrahamic general practices and beliefs. I think uh, if you look into the history of uh, Allah or Allah or Allah, we find that this is this is merely in reference to the high god or the highest god or even in cultures where there are more gods accepted what i find interesting though is uh in the quran um isn't there in the quran there is this one polemical verse in which uh the quran rejects the idea that allah has three daughters uh so and then how is that exactly how is that reconciled with the idea that Allah is merely, you know, merely of this Abrahamic origin. Could it be that these pre-Islamic uh, Arab pagans also had this idea of that same God, but then they just attributed uh, more deities uh, as immediate family members to that God? And, uh, you know, mm. it, it, it seems a little bit cloudy to me, honestly. <laughs> yeah, so here I suppose one should distinguish between, so there's different groups that we're talking about here. So for those people who are having effectively this new deity and, and religion gradually becoming dominant and almost imposed on them, then they're likely to try and preserve 
some aspects of their religion. So, for example, in um, Brazil, when Christianity spreads, there was a, a black kind of female deity. And so then they, in their thinking, they assimilate Mary, the mother of God, to this black deity. So you can understand from their side. So I could understand from the perspective of pagan Meccans, um, which I'll just say for the sake of argument, who worship Hubo, that they might, to, to preserve aspects of their own pagan culture, say that, well, you know, Hubo is Allah, really, you know, in the same way as some pagans did actually make an identification between Zeus and the Christian God. But that's a different group from, I suppose, those people who are doing the converting and propagandizing, if you like, on behalf of you know, Christianity and so on. So I, I, we have to allow for different visions and perspectives on the deity. This could, this could indicate and imply that um, the belief in Hobal and in the other deities is a more native belief to these people in pre-Islamic Arabia and that they uh, later on adopt uh, certain ideas from different beliefs and create a yeah. synchronism between these. Between these. Yeah, because if you're thinking well, from a more secular perspective, monotheism doesn't really have that much substance. It's mainly a belief in a single one God. And when you actually start taking apart those monotheisms, you realize actually most of the stuff that goes into it, the stuffing, is actually pagan bits. So in Christianity, you know, as we come up to Christmas, you think, well, there's the Christmas tree. I mean, that's a classic <laughs> Viking yeah. pagan um, belief. And there's a whole host of, of things that really have come from different pagan groups and been put into yeah. and accepted by you know and made part of that monotheism to give it a bit mm -hmm. more stuffing and, and really as was pointed out a long time ago in the 19th century a lot of the rituals of the pilgrimage muslim pilgrimage they just have such a pagan feel to them that it's hard to think they're not a local practice that manages to make it get preserved in islam that's that's the issue with um i mean i'm trying to be uh in that regard, I'm trying to be really as uh, objective and reasonable as possible. But uh, a while after I stopped believing that this religion is uh, you know, absolutely true, I had to, I kept looking at the Kaaba, at the circumambulation, at the practices of the pilgrimage, the Hajj, and it just, I can't really, uh, you know, put my finger on it and put it into words, but I just keep getting this perception, this feeling, wait a minute, this doesn't really look like, you know, <laughs> uh, monotheistic uh, worship. This simply looks like something, you know, of tribalistic very ancient mm. tribalistic polytheistic origin that leads way back and that we can't really explain within Islamic you know, mm. narratives. But as, as I say, effectively, you know, for, as a more secular person, <laughs> my perspective, I mean, I can look at, because I don't mean anything against Islam when I say it has you know, these pagan elements in it, because so does Christianity. I mean, if you look at Easter, you know, great festival, it's, it's, it's a famous pagan festival, the yeah. Easter festival, the beginning of the new year, a new birth, a new growth. So in Christianity, you get all these things about eggs and so on. It's classic kind of pagan belief, but yeah. that doesn't necessarily diminish it. And, and the same for Islam. I mean, it, it's got a lot of classic pagan features, and you really see this in the pilgrimage. But you know, okay, that's maybe it standard. is then a mistake to separate uh, monotheism from uh, polytheism so much and to put a barrier between them as if they were completely different two things. But it could be more that uh, religion and culture develops over time and things simply merge into each other. And certain tribalistic polytheistic practices merge into the newly adopted monotheistic beliefs. Yeah, I think where it changes the polytheistic to monotheistic view, you're right, in some ways it's just more, it's not so different. But the big change is the idea that there's only one dominant God and everyone else is wrong. If they follow another God, they're wrong. <laughs> that perspective is a, unfortunately a very negative one for world history, you could say, well, unless you're a military historian. But the pagan one where you know, the classic Arabian proverb is when you pass a place, pay your respects to its gods is a, is a <laughs> classic pagan one. It's, it's pagan gods are local. They're not single trans-regional dominant forces. They're local. They might have a little bit more breadth, but they're not. I mean, um, the, the Nabataean 
main god is classic Dushara. Dushara is the lord of the Shara, meaning that mountain range where he dwells and has dominance. And, and that is a big change, that more local and tolerant perspective, religious perspective, to a much more universalist and intolerant view that changes. Could, could we say that big change? Could we say that pre-Islamic polytheism was, um, in a sense, uh, you know, accepting and uh, pluralistic, even when it came to uh, beliefs that are, you know, not polytheistic, that are outside of its own sphere of multiple gods and all that. So uh, I, don't, I don't know if you, if you want me to clarify this question, but yeah, can you say, clarify that a bit. Yeah. Uh, so could we say that the pre-Islamic polytheists were a little bit more? Um, you know, not not as much, uh, not as exclusivist, but more accepting of the beliefs of others, even if these other people held beliefs that are contrary to their own polytheistic understanding, such as uh, when Christians you know, came to them or when Jews came to them. Could we say that the polytheists were in general accepting of the Christians and the Jews despite their beliefs, or was there hostility toward them? Yeah, it's an interesting question. I mean, I don't want to romanticize and say that, you know, our pagan life was lovely. And <laughs> <everyone> was <very laughs> yeah. I, but I do mean it, it happens on a, a more localized sphere. So, But when Jews and Christians came, so uh, the difference the, between pagans, you're going to see less of a sense that you have to follow my God. Mm -hmm. So the difference when Jews and Christian propagandists arrive you know, in a pagan village is that they're going to say your gods are wrong uh -huh. and you have to get rid of them and so the pagans aren't necessarily going to be <laughs> so welcoming and often there was a arabia is more different but in a lot of places and especially where christianity was spread by european colonialists then you're seeing a dominance dimension to it which actually happens earlier to some extent but it's, it's very strong that tying up of power goes with also an idea that our god is the the only god you must follow you must get uh -huh. rid of all your beliefs so well, you could understand that they're not that's not so well received and of course uh -huh. that's the narrative in the quran and the islamic sources that a number of the pagan meccan didn't really like this idea that they were had to jettison the beliefs of their forefathers well, that's the thing, and I think uh, this is kind of the power of indoctrination here. When I, you know, as I grew up, I kept learning this entire narrative that the pre-Islamic polytheists were like horrible people, and they were very intolerant and very hostile towards uh, these pure ideas of belief in one God and worshiping one God and all that. But then, um, I don't know. When I stepped outside of it, I thought, wait a minute. I mean, it's it's not like it's not like uh, you know Muhammad is doing something. And just minding his own business and these people are coming and telling him hey you are not allowed to do whatever you're doing no but what's actually happening is that he is saying and he's coming out and asserting that their gods are false and they are doomed and they are wrong and they will go to hell and uh only allah is the true god and then they and then and they even according to the islamic narrative they even repeatedly tell him please you know do whatever you want just stop this just stop uh you know condemning the beliefs of your forefathers and our and our you know our gods and in the end they turn intolerant so what is actually happening here is these that these people are not uh, oppressing him for simply minding his own business and practicing his religion mm. they are becoming hostile in reaction to his um intolerant exclusivist ideology yeah and the main kind of complaint they have is a is a pretty broad one for pagans against this sort of intrusion of monotheism where this is the religion of our forefathers it's a community religion and it's it's an old tradition so yeah very much in the end muhammad was trampling local traditions and that goes for wherever christianity spread really throughout the middle east paganism in general is a more local by and large it's a localized affair and so it's it's got a very strong communitarian dimension to it for sure what is the whole um thing like when we when we learn about Islam, we learn that uh, certain gods are very prominent, uh, like Allah and Uzza and Manat and uh, all that. What is um, the significance of these people? This might be a very nonsensical question. I don't know. I didn't, I didn't really think this through. But <laughs> what is the significance of this diversity of uh, gods that is being worshipped by these people? Like, what, what do they hope from 
uh, worshiping different gods? And is it just that these uh, each one of these gods goes back a long way with certain tribes and they then come together and unite these gods? Uh, and do they serve as a general god to, to their own tribes? Uh, I don't know if you can so, help me understand this, but... So we, I put, for the Tejezi world, we don't have that much information. But if we go to Yemen, say, so very near, kind of reasonable comparison, where we have a huge amount of inscriptions which are, offer prayers or thanksgiving and requests to deities, you can see that you have kind of higher gods of broad communities, so there's a number of different peoples in South Arabia, Sabah, people of Hadramalk, Kataban. So each of them have a deity for the whole community. But then after that, you get deities of places. So presumably, this area is important to you for whatever reason, for your and that probably more local community. You see deities for specific professions. Um, so it, it's it's. Again, is that more deities serve, if you like, to sacralize certain, you know, the most important factors of our lives, the place we live, the jobs we do. You'll also see some, for certain key aspects of human life. So fertility is one, being able to have children, you'll often go to a certain one. I mean, some of these re reassert themselves <laughs> in, in, just because they serve important human functions in monotheism. So in Christianity, for example, you want to go on a perilous journey, you pray to St. Christopher, you know, you want to have a baby, you pray, you know, so, you know, we have, you pray to different saints, and if you like, this is a kind of certain resurgence of a more pagan way of thinking. One thing that I find so funny is, um, I don't know if it's, it's probably a bit uh, disrespectful when I, <laughs> when I belittle this practice, but, uh, and I guess we only have Islamic sources about this, or maybe some different sources, but this whole uh, divination uh, arrows, of shooting arrows into the sky and then depending on which arrow goes further or which arrow is closer you then come to a conclusion that your god told you to go with this choice instead of that choice is that an accurate description of what people actually would do or <laughs> is this again just based on legends or yes divination is a bit of a uh, kind of catch-all for a whole host of practices where which you know is an understandable thing that humans still want today is to reduce unpredictability in your life and make decisions so ideally you want more information so you can do it by practices or <laughs> uh, you know, especially for pre-modern setup where you're, it's much more difficult to make scientific determination so but how it was done so you get kind of mocking though some of the islamic sources are kind of mocking that these pagan practices whereas presumably you know they, they made a lot of sense at the time it's difficult because we for us being able to massively determine a lot of things in our lives and with you know, an impressive science that can reduce and mitigate disasters then it's difficult for us to get into the minds of people who had so little influence and was you know so much a plaything you know of various you know, factors you know, weather disease and so on and so it becomes you know really important to have these different tools divination magic and so on which would be i mean you could liken as often is magic to science where you're using it to try and have some influence you know determine you know, I, I mean, I, influence I, nature yeah I guess it would be kind of easy to simply rely on, <laughs> in the example of arrows, to simply shoot two arrows and then just go with whatever uh, seems to be the correct answer instead of uh, praying and thinking about it and then, and then going with your gut feelings. I guess it's easier to do the to do the the more primitive one. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we have you'll find these. Uh, so there's a you know an old one in medieval Europe. So you have a dice and you simply have on the oh. faces of it the thing that you'll do in that situation. And so you roll the dice. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I mean actually Japan is quite big on um, different forms of divination. So there's still a number of advanced cultures that, that use divination in different ways. Right? Yeah. Uh, one more issue which is uh Mecca. 
Now, uh, the Islamic narrative is very big on Mecca, and uh, basically, um, even if so, the, the Quran calls Mecca the mother of cities, uh, and in Muslim culture, it is generally understood and taught that Mecca was of huge significance before uh, Islam as well, that it has a vast history, that people came there from all around. Uh, but when we look at the history, we don't really find anything about Mecca uh, prior to Islam. Right? We only find some hints at certain things that may be identified with Mecca. Uh, what can what can you say about that? For me, it is very easy to say, uh, hey, it looks like Mecca was not significant at all. This is all just made up. But <laughs> what would you say from a more academic perspective about this? Yeah, so there's a few fixed points, I suppose. Well, one, there is zero concrete information about Mecca before Islam. So end of story. Even when people use the Quran, which you just did, they um, <laughs> the Quran doesn't actually say Mecca is the modern mother of cities. So it refers to the mother of cities, but didn't identify it. Um, the second thing, although there hasn't been archaeological excavation, there were travelers before Saudi Arabia existed who you know, described the place. And what we can say from that is, of course, negative. Travelers passed Palmyra and Petra, you know, saw massive columns and huge structures. So there was nothing like that in Mecca. So it's only kind of been a sort of big trading metropolis, as some, including modern Western scholars, have, have said, because there would have been, you know, just what humans do when you've got a lot of money, you want to show off. And so there's no grand structures. Um, what was there before? I mean, it's not impossible that Gabra itself was moved, so we can't be 100% sure um, even that that was there before. I tend to assume that you wouldn't get such a radical change in place, though. The fact that Mecca, we get inscription, Arabic inscriptions from the area quite early on, and the fact that the pilgrimage happened to it, I, I don't like the idea, although it's some point out that there was a total change, though, because I tend to feel it's like some people argue that Muhammad was actually you know, a Christian or he was something you know, he didn't exist the problem i always find with this sort of radical change is how did that not get noticed you know as if people are worshiping you know, something totally different and then from, oh now we're going to start worshiping this arabian guy people are likely to say something <laughs> so i could imagine that mecca was one of many sanctuaries early sanctuaries but i can't and that its importance gradually increased but to be honest, i don't take it that likely that it didn't exist at all but it just kind of been that really major sort of metropolis because just, as, as far as i see it to clarify um i just think um the whole you know mecca is not made up the whole story of it is not made up mm -hmm. i just think to me it just looks like um as you as you very much hinted uh mecca was a place of certain religious practices for a small tribe and it wasn't of historical uh you know global significance but after the rise of islam which happened due to many different factors, uh, the, the importance of Mecca was hugely, uh, you know, blown out of proportion. It was turned into something hugely significant that it actually wasn't uh, prior to Islam. That's what it looks like to me, but that's just me. And but one thing is also um, the Romans. The Romans were interested in conquering places of great value. And uh, what we have, what you also describe in your books, is that they don't go much further south than, I don't know, uh, just south of Medayan Saleh and these regions. And Mecca would then be very near for them you know, to simply go and conquer if it was a place of such huge significance. But they never even refer to it. They never give any importance to it. It's never touched. That just looks to no. me like the Islamic narrative is a little bit problematic. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the one little factoid <laughs> that people pick up is this reference in um, a Latin geographical source to Makoraba. Yeah, yeah. Um, and a lot is made of this, um, uh, using this interpretation of it as an Aramaic expression for Maka Rabba, so big Mecca, great Mecca. But it really strains to my mind interpretation uh, and it's very vague where he where i think it's Pliny that he says it is 
So, yeah, to my mind, it doesn't really, it's not very convincing to argue that that is meta. And even in that text, the description of it is basically that there is a place along the coast that people go to and that, you know, <laughs> and that there, there is not much, there's not a huge significance given to that either. It's just, it just happens to appear as far as I understand. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Finally, um, this is not entirely uh, the topic of our conversation. I would love to have, a, have another conversation with you on this very specific topic, the spread of Islam. There is often a, um, people often wonder how exactly it happened that uh, such an underdeveloped uh, culture or such an underdeveloped variety of cultures like, uh, you know, Arabia uh, exploded and expanded so rapidly from that, you know, primitive point mm -hmm. into uh, the Roman and Persian uh, empires and conquered so much land in such little time. And uh, some people, some apologists even go as far as to claim that this is kind of, uh, this is somehow miraculous and it somehow proves the truth of Islam. Uh, to me, it seems like this is not necessarily miraculous. It may just be a series of, you know, events of luck and certain other cultures nomadic tribes in asia did the same things over and over again at different times in history mm. uh what is your i i very much read your opinion on on this whole issue in the mm. book but what is but what is your opinion on uh how and why the arabs managed to suddenly expand and shock the world like that yeah there's a few different questions in that really <laughs> People focus on the actual scale of the conquest, but to me, that's actually the least um, surprising because pastoralist groups are very good at it. They have a lot of access to manpower and military training. So Mongols, Turks, you're right, throughout history, they managed to achieve conquests very fast and very and, uh, on a big scale. But what they don't normally manage to do is to hold on to it for very mm. long. And that's actually, to my mind, the fascinating thing about the Arab conquest. I deliberately called my book, gave the subtitle in my book, In God's Path to Arab Conquest and Islamic Civilization, because the conquests do lead onto a broad civilization that endures. And that's the striking bit of it. And that's the bit that needs kind of more taking apart. It's got much more to do with the way in which Islam spread among settled peoples. It's not, so it's not to do with the initial expansion. The success of the initial expansion, and again, it has the same factors as the Mongol conquest, where you have a lot of pastoralist groups in not just Arabia, well, Arabia going up into in the Syrian desert to that broad area near the Roman and Persian centers. And the great thing that, for, as I said, pastoralist groups, one, they're used to military training from a young age, and two, it's possible to somebody can be left behind to look after the animals mm -hmm. and a lot of the high proportion of people can go off to fight whereas agriculturists don't have that luxury pre-modern agriculture requires a high amount of people so only a small amount relatively can be spared so pastoralist groups have manpower so that kind of explains the, their successes the, the initial impetus is still interesting why exactly then I just take it that because the empires are weakened by their the Roman and Persian empires, uh, substantially weakened after 25 years of war, that this is a great opportunity. You know, what tends to happen with pastoralist groups is they're always raiding because they find it difficult to get enough food and sustenance off just breeding their own animals. So they tend to launch raids, and we know that from Roman sources that all the time they're reporting small scale raids, but they're kept in check. Presumably, they weren't kept in check in the 630s, and therefore it kind of snowballed. Could it be that um, the, the, the difference here is, um, and I have to credit Islam here, I guess, but could it be that the difference is uh, very much that, um, for example, when the Mongols invaded half the world, uh, they were quite ruthless in their, in their expansions. Uh, and when they conquered lands, they were very much simply focused on becoming conquerors, becoming the leaders, the gods of the world, and created this uh, syncretism of their own religion and the local religions, or ended up converting to Islam, for example. Uh, when other tribes conquered 
lands, they were very much focused on simply becoming richer and you know benefiting from the riches of the places that they conquered. Whereas in Islam, um, Islam did not simply that the Muslims did not simply conquer and pillage. What they did is they conquered and pillaged, but they also established a system which made sure that everything will stay in place. This will become the new law. Everyone will abide by this. There will be no more infighting and so on. So could it be that uh, it is merely Islam which gave a little bit structure and which prevented these conquered lands from slipping away again? So again, you're talking about the later point. Why does it lead to an enduring civilization, not the, you, you're mixing up two things there, because the, the conquest, it, it's easy to say, well, the Muslims were nicer than the Mongols. That's probably not true, to be honest. <laughs> you know, there's, in fact, it's interesting, really, people, I think, probably, probably because academics are relatively left-wing, but there's a lot of, I mean, there's one professor, Fred Donald, Chicago, who came up with this idea of the non-violent conquest. Of the Muslims, it's, it's a kind of apologetic idea. Conquests are violent, and the wow. Muslim sources are quite happy. They don't actually have any problem with saying that we beheaded lots of people and set fire yeah. to the things. <laughs> so, so the Muslims are not being at all PC about it. So it's plenty of good violence, beheadings, everything is all there, slaughter, the works. Um, so that bit's quite similar. But you're right in that. Of course, why does it continue on and lead to a new civilization? The, the Mongols have nothing to offer. In terms of religion, nobody wants to convert to the, the sky god. Very few people, of the Christians and, and Jews. Whereas converting to Islam, one interesting thing about Islam is it has having no clergy means there's no. You don't need to do anything to convert. You don't need to have lessons with a priest or something like that, which is a potential bar. It's easy for anyone to convert, and. It obviously fits very closely within Judeo-Christian Abrahamic religion, and that obviously helps. But then there's a whole host of other factors, I think, as well that matter. But that's certainly one of them. That mm -hmm. Islam makes it, it it integrates and makes it easy for people to share in this new. I, I guess one thing that made it strong to me, uh, in my opinion, is that um, contrary to some other uh, religious ideas, Islam had this simple thing: like, okay, we conquered you. Uh, you can simply escape death by converting as well, or you can make an agreement with us and uh, pay so much protection money and then live in our land as lesser people as long as you pay the money. Uh, but as far as I understand, that didn't necessarily go very smoothly in many cases, especially in the early conquests where people were massacred without even the chance of uh, becoming becoming the Mies and paying the jizya. Yeah, I mean, one of the problems we have, and this is true of any um, war situation, is that it gets written up later and it gets simplified and systematized and it's it's clinicized really because it's away from the bloodshed. So this very simple idea that the Muslims walked along and said, hey, you can either pay your tax or you can convert or you can be killed. You know, nice, simple. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And again, it's the kind of the way that conquerors, that the conquering narrative works, it, it's kind of seen as when it gets written up, it's a nice, simple kind of thing. It's like you know, films of battles of World War Two or something. Yeah, it's very yeah. easy, you know. We clever allies managed to defeat those nasty, <laughs> stupid Germans. You know, <laughs> it doesn't get sort of tidied up. Whereas if you actually kind of go into the detail, it's a lot, lot <laughs> more yeah, messy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, that's a, that's very fair. <laughs> that is very fair. Well, uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Hyland. I really appreciated this conversation. I think uh, there was a lot to take from here, a lot to learn. I would I would also love to uh, meet up again sometime, talk about mm. varieties of different uh, matters. I really appreciate your work. Thank you so much for what you're doing. Uh, is there anything else that you want to uh, share? No, thanks very much for giving me the opportunity to talk about a subject I really love. So that was great. Thank you. That's awesome. That's a, that's a pleasure to me. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Everybody, thank you for watching. Uh, I will see you again very soon. Let me know what you think uh, about this conversation and about future conversations in the comment section. I will see you again, everybody. Have a fantastic day. Yeah. I usually say a final line, but I don't want to say that when I have academics on here. So. <laughs> <laughs>